like to request all participants to refrain from screen capturing the slides as this contain unpublished data. Again, we would like to request all participants to refrain from screen capturing the slides as those as this contain unpublished data. Okay, so for our first plenary talk of the 29th Philippine Biodiversity Symposium, our two distinguished speakers will talk about the deep past and their relevance to Philippine biodiversity conservation. Our, our speakers for today are Dr. Janine Ochoa and Dr. Lawrence Heaney. Dr. Ochoa holds a PhD in archaeology from the University of Cambridge, UK. She is an archaeologist by trade with interest in past human ecology and human landscapes. She specializes in zooarchaeology with a focus on terrestrial mammals and reptiles. Janine is interested in investigating past systems of ecological knowledge, value environments, biogeographic patterns, and island evolution in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Currently, she is working on fossil vertebrate assemblages from various archaeological sites in the Philippines. Dr. Lawrence Arhini, or Larry as we call him, began his career as a volunteer at the Smithsonian Institution, Institution's Museum of Natural History, attended the University of Minnesota and worked at the Bell Museum of Natural History as an undergraduate and received his PhD in Systematics and Ecology from the University of Kansas. He began conducting research in the Philippines in 1981 and has led teams of researchers, both foreign and local, to many remote areas where they have discovered dozens of previously unknown species of mammals, documented patterns of diversity along elevational and disturbance gradients, and inferred the histor historical processes that have led to the development of this highly distinctive fauna. He worked with Filipino colleagues to establish the Wildlife Conservation Society of the Philippines in 1992, now the Biodiversity Conservation Society of the Philippines. And Larry has been serving as Emeritus member of the Board of Directors uh, for this society. He's also a member of the Interna International Biography, Biography uh, Society. So let's welcome Janine and Larry. Okay. Um, magandang araw. Good day to everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> um, Larry and I are very pleased to be invited to this uh, first plenary session of the uh, 29th Annual Symposium of the BCSP. We are uh, presenting uh, this work on behalf of our colleagues and co-investigators, Dr. Mandy Mejares and uh, Dr. Ami Garong. And um, Larry and I will take turns in, in, in this presentation. So um, it's actually my first time to uh, join, attend the BCSP Symposium. So I'm very excited. Um, and I guess it's one of the advantages of our setup here that we can join the symposium from wherever we are. Um, our, our aim in sharing um, our work on fossils, on mammal fossils, uh, with the BCSP is that, of course, fossils provide us with historical records. Um, and this allows us to better understand the modern living fauna. And of course, one of the main ways we learn about evolutionary and ecological history of organisms is through the fossil record. So in this talk, uh, Larry and I will uh, first provide a background on the um, vertebrate fossil research that's covering zooarchaeology, which is the discipline I come from, uh, and then a bit on uh, mammalian evolutionary patterns and by geography in the Philippines, and then also a quick geological uh, overview. We will then present some of the fossil, new fossil finds, and our focus will be on two islands on Luzon and Palawan. And then we'll talk a little bit about extinction records on these islands and then give a summary and discussion. Yeah, so Larry is, I'm sure, well known to, to most of you. Um, for my part, I got into this study of uh, uh, studying uh, fossil vertebrates through archaeology, uh, particularly the specialization called zooarchaeology, which is the study of animal remains from archaeological sites. Um, 
animal teeth and bones are some of the most commonly preserved archaeological remains. And so you find a lot of fossils and subfossils in archaeological sites. Now, because these animal remains are often accumulated by people because of hunting and consumption, archaeologists are also able to examine human and animal interactions in the past. Now, um, zooarchaeological data is also useful for conservation science. There is a, a field uh, called applied zooarchaeology, actually, you know, that, is, um, that really aims to uh, contribute to conservation science. This is also why I'm very pleased to be speaking to an audience of conservationists, because we would like to share this kind of information that we hope is useful for, for you. Um, so typically, um, typically when I uh, when I give a uh, typically when I talk about fossil fauna, it's usually to an archaeology audience and anthropology audience, uh, and I always have to justify why do we have to study Philippine fossil fauna. But I think for this audience, you know quite well how fantastic and how unique and how amazing uh, Philippine fauna are. Um, however, we do know relatively little about the fossil history of the vertebrate fauna, the living vertebrate fauna. The global Holocene record actually indicates that these modern faunas are transformed faunas in the sense that they have uh, been impacted by different human populations for thousands of years, well before what is, what we, what is sometimes called as the Anthropocene. For, uh, but for Southeast Asia in the Philippines, relatively, we, know, we don't know much about the, the chronology and the timing and, and the nature of these uh, interactions in the past. And so the paleozoological records are important or necessary to understand these natural, quote unquote, biogeographic patterns and biological processes prior to human colonization. Um, and for Southeast Asia, we're not actually just talking about our species, Homo sapiens. Uh, as we will uh, mention later on, there are other uh, species of archaic humans that have been uh, recently discovered in the islands of Southeast Asia. Uh, but first, a little more background on what we know about the mammal fauna of the archipelago, and I'm going to pass this on to Larry. Hey. So, um, hello to everyone. Um, delighted that you're able to join us. Um, some of this that I, what, what I want to summarize now is just a little bit about the, the extremely uh, unique nature of the Philippine mammal fauna. Certainly, it's not confined to mammals, but, but the mammals certainly are outstanding. And I'm, I'm going to talk about the non flying mammals. Um, so, Bats, of course, because they're able to fly, tend to have broader distributions, somewhat different um, patterns, um, but a lot of similarities. Um, but it would add too much complexity to what we have time to talk about today. So non-flying native mammal species. So this is a map that shows the Philippines and its faunal regions. Um, and I want to point out the the um, astoundingly high levels of uniqueness to the faunas in the different parts of the Philippines. So up at the top, Greater Luzon Island, and we'll define that in just a moment. 93% of the species occur nowhere else in the world, not even anywhere else in the Philippines. 52 out of 56 species live nowhere else in the world. So the Philippines um, is marked by a series of, of faunal regions like that. Um, Greater Mindoro, for example, 12 of the 16 species of native non-flying mammals there live nowhere else in the world, not even on the other islands in the Philippines. Down in the south, um, hopefully you can see that down there again, it's 92 percent of the species occur nowhere else in the world, not even elsewhere in the Philippines. So there is a, a level of geographic complexity here that's very, very important in understanding these uh, overall and long-term distribution patterns. 
I want to point out also, while we're looking at this map, that often this, the sea channels that separate these faunal regions often are very, very narrow. So what this suggests is that, um, that these animals are not very good at swimming across sea channels. Occasionally, they may get lucky and ride on a log. It does happen because all of these islands that are, are um, volcanic in origin do have species of mammals on them, but clearly it's something that happens rarely. Well, we wanna know, among other things, how rarely. Okay, next slide. All right, so the reason why these faunal regions exist is that during the last glacial maximum, when, where, when Chicago, where I live, was covered by ice about two kilometers thick. That was uh, 20,000 years ago up until about 12,000 years ago. During that period of time, um, water that had been in, in the world oceans had evaporated um, and uh, uh, then fallen out as snow on the continents and had remained there. And as the, continent, the continental snow gradually built up, into glaciers, thick, thick layers of, of ice covering the northern continents. <clears throat> sea level, since the seas were providing that moisture, sea level went down. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, during the last glacial maximum, sea level dropped to about 120 meters below the present level. If you map that out, what you see on the right there, is what the Philippines looked like about uh, between 20 and uh, 20,000 and 12,000 years ago. That's the pattern that forms the faunal regions that we see so clearly now. Um, animals are able to disperse readily over dry land. They are not readily able to disperse over, over sea channels. Okay, next slide. So this leads to a number of questions. One is, okay, so that's on a geological time scale. 20,000 years ago is, is a, the blink of an eye. How much further back do we have to go? How much further back can we go to understand the history of the development of this really distinctive mammal fauna? Well, this is a series of maps that show roughly what the Philippines would have looked like beginning in the upper left at about 20 million years ago. And what you can see here are in, in black, the outlines of where the modern islands are going to be. Most of them were well below sea level um, at this time. So a couple of little islands scattered around. By 15 million years ago, and that's an important date, I'll come back to that in a moment, by 15 million years ago, you can see that there are a few more islands. Um, and up in what's now northern Luzon, there was a moderately good sized island um, with some highland areas beginning to develop. Down in the bottom left, 10 million years ago, there are more uh, islands appearing. Mindoro, for example, is now above water. Um, the, the island that now is in the uh, northern central Cordillera, northern Luzon, has become larger. There continues to be lots and lots of volcanic activity there. Um, other islands down in the south, in the, uh, what's to become the southern Philippines, are forming up and gradually moving further north because of geological tectonic activity. In the bottom right-hand corner, five million years ago, we're beginning to see something that starts to look a little bit like the modern Philippines, but um, there are, the islands are still small. Uh, there are, are, they're scattered, and many of them are not yet connected together. They're, they're not connected in the form that we think of them today. So this history of island, of modern island development, island in the sense of areas above sea level, began somewhere around roughly 20 million years ago, probably a bit earlier than that with some small islands, perhaps 25, maybe even 30 million years ago, but small, um, uh, quite small area. 
uh, sm small in, in area. Um, and it's not until 5 million years ago, which is geologically, again, very recent, that we begin to see something that looks like the modern Philippines. That's important because, next slide, we can see that if we look at, in this case, in the individual island of Luzon, that each of the different parts of the modern island actually began as a separate island that only gradually merged into the modern island of Luzon. So the oldest area that has been continuously above water is in northern Luzon, um, perhaps beginning about 27 million years ago. Um, the area in the northern part of, of Zambales, so um, I don't know if you can find that, Janine, roughly 18 million years ago, there you go. Uh, roughly 18 million years ago, there was an island forming there. Lots of other places, they didn't begin to form up until about 5 million years ago and sometimes more recently than that. So it really wasn't until about a half million years ago, geologically very recent, that Luzon existed, began to exist as an island in the way that we think about it today. So there's a very deep history involved in these land areas where these animals live today. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are these animals that are, that are present? Um, well, I'm gonna focus on Luzon for right now. So at the top here in this top diagram, what you're seeing is essentially a branch on the tree of life, um, giving rise from a single ancestor that arrived somewhere around 14 million years ago, maybe 16 million, somewhere in there, that gave rise to all of the members of the group that we now refer to as cloud rats. This group occurs only in the Philippines. So it's not that there are just 21 species that occur in the Philippines. There are are, these are members of a, an entire branch on the tree of life that occurs nowhere else. And they are descended from a common ancestor that has been in the area of modern Luzon Island for at least 14 million years. These animals have been very, very persistent. They've survived over very long periods of time and they've gradually diversified. So that now the giant uh, cloud rats, some of them weigh up to 2.7 kilos. Some of them, the tiny little Maseromis, um, uh, are only about, uh, oh, about 20 grams. So they're, they're tiny little mice, very, very diverse. The second group, the ones that we refer to as earthworm mice because they like to eat earthworms, their common ancestor arrived, we think about 8 million years ago. And again, they have persisted and they've diversified into very, uh, quite varied um, ecologies and different body forms, feeding on different kinds of animals. So again, it's an entire branch on the tree of life that is present only in the Philippines. And in fact, most of them occur only on the Zon Island. So there is a great deal of depth, of, of temporal depth, to the species that we see here today. Next slide. So um, I think that Janine is now going to talk a little bit about the extant mammal fauna of Luzon. I'll jump back in a, in a little bit later on. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you for that background, uh, Larry. So um, yes, so... Um, these are some of the living members of the non-flying mammals of Luzon. Uh, Larry has described some of the, the cloud rats and the earthworm mice. Um, and of course, the, that vaunted diversity and endemism uh, we know on Luzon resides in the small mammal fauna. There are also some uh, native large mammals. So you have uh, Rusa mariana in Isa and the wild pig suspelipensis. Um, to contrast with Palawan, uh, so this is this is uh, the living um, um, mammal fauna for some of the some of the uh, living mammals on uh, Palawan. 
uh, we understand that the Palawan fauna is a rather different uh, fauna from the rest of the Oceanic Philippines. Um, so there is a uh, deer called the Kalamian hog deer. Uh, it, uh, Palawan also has its own wild pigs, so Sahonobarbus, you have the mouse deer on Balaba, and then you have these other medium-sized mammals only found in Palawan and whose closest uh, uh, relatives, evolutionary relatives, are, are on Borneo. We also have these uh, carnivores and macaques no? um, also found in Palawan, and a subset of this is sometimes found in the oceanic Philippines, but now we think that these are uh, non-native. So like Yubaha Musang and uh, the macaque are likely non-native in the oceanic Philippines, but there is an argument to be, that can be made for their native status uh, on, on Palawan. Now, let's go on to the actual fossil record uh, for Palawan and Luzon. Uh, let's start with Palawan. Um, the time period I'm, we're dealing with actually is what we call the late quaternary, that's the Pleistocene and the Holocene combined. Uh, the fossil records we're looking at are from the late Pleistocene to the Holocene. And the oldest records we're going to be talking about are from about 70,000 years ago to the uh, Holocene or the last 11,000 years ago. On Palawan, these are some of the archaeological, major archaeological sites where we find uh, vertebrate uh, fossil assemblages. So in southern Palawan, you have the famous Tawan Cave Complex, and then you also have sites in northern Palawan in El Nido. Um, Tabon Cave has the oldest record for our species, Homo sapiens, um, and the date for that is about 40,000 years ago. So the oldest evidence of Homo sapiens on the direct fossil evidence is uh, 40,000 years ago. Uh, previously, from the Ili Cave fauna, we've also described the presence of uh, extinct tiger and deer and a possible canid. Uh, so that's the Ili Cave fauna, the oldest layers for that is dated to the terminal Pleistocene or about 14 to 16,000 years ago. So that's, this, is an, this is known, the, the, the fossil record for this. Um, tiger is actually, um, so the tiger, the fossil tiger was first described from Ili Cave. We have very few specimens uh, of tiger, tatlo lang, no, from Ili Cave. Um, so they're quite rare. We also describe yeah, so it's on the on the right uh, are our, our deer fossils naman. So we describe two uh, different species of deer. What we're sharing to you today is new information from a, a, another site, a new site, um, not quite new actually. We re-excavated uh, this site uh, in 2016 with the National Museum and the University of the Philippines. Uh, so it's called Pilanduk Cave, and what's very important for this site is that it is of uh, LGM age, so the last glacial maximum uh, or, or, or the last ice age. So the dating, uh, we have direct radiocarbon dates for this site that place it in between 20,000 to 25,000 years ago. Um, now, uh, what's quite important for this site is that it's actually quite rare that we find sites that are of LGM age. So that in itself has a, a lot, Pilando has a lot of information to give us, but I'll focus on the fossil, the large mammals, the fossil large mammals, the tiger and the deer. Um, as we, I mentioned earlier, deer, are, uh, sorry, tigers are quite rare, so tatlo lang before. Now we're adding to that very short inventory nine tiger uh, fossil specimens from this site, uh, Pilando Cave. Um, I just want to mention pala, Pilando Cave is in Quezon Municipality. This is in Southern Palawan. And this is a site that is within the ancestral domain of the indigenous Palawan community. So these are the tiger specimens that we've, uh, we are describing. Um, so only nine specimens. Um, so this row here, um, just in a, a different view um, for, for, but it's the same specimens and then two complete specimens here. The morphology and the measurements of the Pilandok uh, tigers, sorry, so these are pantherines, these are large felids, so pantherines, 
um, if we look at the morphology uh, of these large pantherines from Pilando Cave, they fall, the morphology in the measurements fall really with uh, panthera tigris, yung tiger, rather than the leopard, which is a, a, a smaller, much smaller uh, pantherine. Now we also um, we also have new fossil new record new specimens new records of uh, deer fossils from this site Pilando, um, and the the story of the deer is actually important also for the story of the tiger because presumably this the, the deer were the main prey species of the tiger. Now, uh, as we mentioned, uh, and as you probably know, mayroong, mayroong uh, hog deer sa Calamianes, but not, on, uh, not presently uh, living on Palawan itself. No? What we know from the fossil record um, is that actually this hog deer was also once present on Palawan, the main Palawan island. Um, and, but not only that, my, my, there's a, there was another species as well, belonging to a different genus, uh, the genus Rusa. And this is the, the genus where the other, the sambar deer and the other Philippine deer, like Rusa Mariana, that's uh, where they belong to. During uh, the LGM, by the way, uh, ito yung greater Palawan, where in, uh, when the sea levels are low, you know, the Calamianes, Cuyo, Balaba, uh, are joined to the main island of Palawan to form one, uh, entire land mass, which we typically label as uh, Greater Palawan. Um, so, so those are sort of uh, some of the some of the new discoveries uh, from uh, Pilando Cave. Uh, so these uh, large mammals uh, of LGM age or or from the from the last ice age. Now moving on to Luzon, um, this is a. Um, this is a, a new reconstruction um, that which uh, Belisar Selyanovsky uh, and Larry have been working on. Um, so this um, fantastic uh, reconstruction. And this version is actually updated to reflect the latest fossil discoveries on Luzon. Luzon is a much older record for Pleistocene mammals compared to Palawan. If we zoom into this uh, panorama, we have, um, so we have the deer still living. We have different kinds of pig, a giant pig, uh, Celebacorus. We have Bubalus, uh, which is a large bovid that is related to the living tamarau. We have a rhino, which has a new name, Mesorhinus uh, philippinensis. Uh, and then we have Elephas and Stegodon, uh, these giant, uh, these proboscideans. And then of course we have uh, Homo luzonensis this uh, new species of human that was described in 2019, which you, uh, got, you probably are familiar with. It's one, it was one of the um, like big uh, scientific discoveries for 2019 on the first page of, uh, front page of, of nature. So that's Homo luzonensis. The, the dating for this is minimum 67,000 years ago, but actually that's not the oldest, um, that's, the, the, hindi ito yung pinakamatandang evidence for human or hominin presen presence. We do have evidence for hominin activity in the Philippines during the Middle Pleistocene in the form of stone tools and rhinoceros, bo rhinoceros bones that have evidence of uh, hominin butchery. Now, um, so, so Homo luzonensis is of course discovered from Kalao Cave. No? in um, northeastern Luzon in the, in the Cagayan uh, uh, province. Um, now, Kalao Cave has also produced not just Homo luzonensis, but also um, additional discoveries. So Kalao Cave has, has more in store in terms of discoveries. So in the same cave where we find Homo luzonensis, we also find um, small mammal fossils. Um, earlier this year, we published this work on um, the discovery of three new extinct species of cloud rats. Uh, depicted here in the front page of the Journal of Mammalogy is the artist reconstruction of these three cloud rats, two giant ones and a, a medium-sized one. Uh, and this reconstruction is by uh, Belizar uh, also. So here's Kalo Cave Complex uh, in northeastern Luzon. 
we find fossils actually not just in Talao Cave itself, but actually there are many other caves in, in that uh, limestone formation. So a total of five caves where we describe these cloud rat fossils from. Um, and in, in this work, we're just only actually focusing on the cloud rats. No, ibang story pa yung uh, the other uh, murids. Um, in particular, um, so with the five genera of the cloud rats or the Floemaini, we describe uh, three new species, one each from the uh, genus Batomis, Carpomis, and uh, Craterones. So I'll just describe quickly each of them. No? Let, let's start with the largest ones, yung pinaka malaki or dakal. Uh, so Carpomis dakal um, is uh, a giant cloud rat. No? The holotype is presented here. It's from Minori Cave. Uh, dated to early mid Holocene subfossil. Ito. So, what we did for, for the analysis of these um, species, uh, mainly we had dental and mandibular material. Um, so, we compared the morphology of the teeth of the fossils with the teeth of yung known living relatives. So, in this case, uh, the fossil Carpomis Carpomis Dakal compared with uh, Carpomis Peurus. And then your closely related uh, genus, uh, Moseromis. Now, our reconstruction for Carpomis, just to give you an idea, this is really a large species compared to the extant na Carpomis. So, this is Carpomis melanurus and Carpomis uh, theurus. This is, by the way, the tooth row, yung um, maxillary or upper tooth row. Um, nipin no, no cloud rats. No? And you can see the difference in size. This is depicted here to scale. No? Ganong kalaki yung size difference. In terms of what the, what the, what the live creatures look like, um, yung Carpomis melanurus is this one. So that's the top image here of Carpomis melanurus. Um, yung Carpomis dakal is actually more in the size range of uh, Craterus, Craterome shade in Burgay. No? For scale here, um, para may idea tayo ng scale, modeling this for us is, is actually Larry with his hands. So para we have an idea of, of, of the scale of, of, the, of these creatures. And then there's Moseromis, the really tiny forest mice. Uh, ganun lang kalaki yung mga ngipin nila. Now the second, um, the second species uh, we name as Cryptoromis balik. This is uh, also a giant cloud rat, uh, but it is moderately smaller than the living Cryptoromis on Luzon, on the one in the Cordilleras, Cryptoromis shade in Burgay. Um, so moderately smaller itong Cryptoromis balik from Cryptoromis shade in Burgay. Here we compare it with some living Cryptoromis and yung um, uh, members of the closely related, related genus uh, Batomis. The holotype for this species, by the way, is from uh, the Lan Serpot cave, also in the Kalao cave complex. The third species is uh, called Batomis cagayanensis. This is actually, um, these are this, the fossils of this uh, Batomis was actually first described uh, by Larry et al in 2011, uh, but they didn't name it then. So in this new paper, we, we, uh, we name it as a Batomis cagayanensis. This particular cloud rat um, is, is uh, larger than uh, the known, uh, known living Batomis uh, pre currently uh, on Luzon. Uh, it was only actually found in the same layer where we find Homo luzonensis. So this is the an image of the uh, stratigraphy of Talao Cave. So Batomis cagayanensis is only found there. But the two other giant cloud rats are also found in this layer, but they're also found in younger layers up to, so from 67,000 years ago, we find fossil, we find uh, specimens of the two giant cloud rats even in the Holocene, possibly as young as 2,000 years ago or even younger than that. Um, maybe I'll skip this bit um, and just go to the, the bits about extinction. Um, 
So these species that we described, the tiger, the deer, these three cloud rats are currently extinct. And so we asked the question why they became extinct. The, others, the other megafauna, the middle Pleistocene megafauna are also extinct, uh, but we don't actually have data on why they became extinct, when and when they went, when they became extinct and why. But for the, the tiger, for instance, on Palawan, um, we have um, data to suggest that it's the climatic and environmental changes during the Pleistocene Holoc Holocene transition that was probably the major driver of extinction. Uh, we're in um, Pala Greater Palawan was broken up into islands again. In the LGM during the last glacial maximum, um, the lowland habitats for Palawan is actually quite different from the present day. So savanna habitats expanded during the LGM, whereas into the, into the transition to the Holocene, you see closed rainforest um, uh, expanding. So these change in uh, vegetation, in environment, the inundation of uh, a large part of uh, Palawan led to uh, great habitat loss no, for the deer and for the tiger. Uh, so this is just uh, data na showing uh, yung savanna environments na, na for uh, not actually just Palawan but for uh, a large uh, uh, this savanna corridor for for the Sunda Shell. I'll just skip this bit on Luzon. Um, it's it's like it's a different story for the extinction uh, of the cloud rats on Luzon, whereas. Um, on, on Palawan, the tigers were, affect, were greatly affected by uh, climatic environmental change. These cloud rats actually survived these changes in the last 67,000 years. No? Uh, but the two giant cloud rats, they, uh, they disappear in the late Holocene. And it's around this time that we see various anthropogenic modifications by Homo sapiens, our species, no? uh, from around 4,000 to 2,000 years ago. Uh, this coincides with the introduction of um, um, non-native um, species. No? So this is around the time also that uh, the, the two giant cloud rats, Carpomis and Craterolis, uh, disappeared. No? So we, there is a case to be made that uh, there's human impacts involved in the extinction of uh, the two giant cloud rats. Um, so in summary, uh, we showed some of these uh, new fossil discoveries not primarily from the late Pleistocene from in the LGM of Palawan and um, the late Pleistocene of, of Luzon uh, from, from Kalao Cave. We see that there are different traje trajectories to the Holocene uh, extinctions. And um, I think let's go to this uh, bit uh, and I'll, I'll transfer you, uh, I'll, I'll give back the floor to Larry. Okay. All right. So um, we've used up most of our time. I'm going to keep this pretty brief. I just want to emphasize a couple of points um, from all of this. The first is that I'm just blown away that we're finally learning something about the fossil history of this fantastic mammalian diversity in the Philippines. Um, we've had molecular data that imply that a lot of the, the ancestors of a lot of these animals arrived in the Philippines a long, long, long time ago, but we haven't actually had any fossil evidence for that. Now the, the door is open. We are beginning to actually have hard data uh, about what has gone on with these um, endemic faunas in the past. Um, it's clear that this diversity has, has developed over the course of many millions of years, tens of millions of years. And I would suggest that we should all really be thinking about conservation issues in that context. There have been a lot of species that have evolved in the Philippines. There has been a, um, a there's clear evidence of, of persistence of species and higher level units um, uh, bran entire branches on the tree of life. For millions of years, they have persisted. So we don't see evidence of very high rates of extinction and recolonization. In fact, 
it looks as though colonization from the Asian mainland is, is it, it takes place and it's terribly important, but it's really rare. Persistence has typified the mammal fauna um, as certainly, at least as much, and it seems at this point, more than extinction has. That's important. We need, we need data that allow us to document exactly how that's worked out. Second thing, as Janine indicated, that during the last, say, 50,000 years, so um, modern times, the, the most recent ice age, and the, the period of time prior to the, to the ice age, the interglacial, um, Philippine climate has shifted really dramatically. We see that very clearly on, on Palawan where it looks as though the vegetation that today um, and the climate is generally wet and warm. During the last glacial maximum, the climate was considerably drier and somewhat cooler than it is today. Some of these animals, but the, the, all of the animals that we see in the Philippines today that are native survived those climatic changes. That tells us something very important. We need to look um, at hard data to understand what the effect of future climatic changes might be. We shouldn't simply assume that a major climatic change is going to result in massive extinction all by itself, all because of itself, because we've got evidence that species, many, many, many species survived a massive change only about 20,000 years ago. Next thing, <clears throat> I've for a long time thought that humans had been present in most of the Philippines for not any more than about 20 or 25,000 years. So relatively brief period of time with much of it over the, you know, much of the human population existing only for the last 4,000 years or so. Well, we now know that humans have been present at least at times in the Philippines for over 700,000 years. During that time, again, a great many mammal species have persisted. So we need to think very carefully and we need to gather data about the, what the impact of human presence has been on the Philippine fauna. Now, in the case of these giant cloud rats, we do see evidence, what, what seems to be likely evidence of human involvement in extinction of at least two species of cloud rats. So I'm not suggesting that humans haven't caused extinction and perhaps are not in the, certainly not suggesting that it's not going on right now. What I do mean to suggest is that the, the impact of human presence and human activities depends a great deal on the circumstances. And that with the, with the beginning now of information about what's gone on in the past, we can begin to understand when humans have been involved in causing extinction and perhaps figure out more about exactly what it is that went, what went on. You know, 4,000 years ago is when there were massive changes in culture, um, new cultural practices coming into the Philippines. Um, um, and the importation of, for example, probably domestic pigs um, and um, uh, uh, domestic dogs. Um, perhaps that is when um, the, the, the exotic carnivores, the, the, the Vivera and Paradoxurus came in, monkeys perhaps about 4,000 years ago. What impact did they have? How did that work? We can now begin to understand those things. And I find that to be just tremendously exciting. Um, again, we're, you know, we're seeing now the beginnings of a, of a long-term time uh, temporal context for understanding the origin of Philippine biodiversity and the threats that we see to that biodiversity today. And that's all that I have to say about that. Oh. Except to say that, um, and uh, Janine, you can chip in here too. The the work that we've been talking about is based on on uh, 
uh, research efforts by a lot of people over a very long period of time from many, many institutions. Um, this is just a, a relatively brief li list. Um, we are profoundly grateful to all of those people and, and to those institutions. Janine, you wanna add anything there? Uh, I think we could end with that. I just thank you to, to the organizers, to you, Larry. Thank you for, for the audience, for, for your attention. Okay. Okay. Yep. Are we done? So thank you very much, uh, Larry and Janine for the wonderful presentation. We proceed immediately to the Q&A. Um, I have several here now. Uh, this is from Aldrich Joshua Reyes. He says, good morning and slash good evening to Larry, who is in the US, by the way. Uh, my name is Aldrich Reyes, a second year BS biology student um, of the University of Nueva Caceres. I think this is in Naga. My question is, I think this is technical. How well preserved are the fossil specimens found in the Philippines, given that the condition to preserve fossils here are not uh, favorable? Uh, let me answer that question. Um, the, yeah, true in the tropics, uh, preservation of uh, organisms are not as good as, for instance, um, in, in uh, colder, area, colder regions. Um, it's quite variable, uh, the preservation in the tropics. Um, so caves, for instance, they're good places uh, that preserve fossils relatively well. Uh, and so you, you, you see that there's a lot of uh, vertebrate assemblages actually coming from caves, apart from the fact that humans actually bring these animals into caves uh, as, as well. Uh, we have less evidence for what we call open sites. But for instance, um, like in the Cagayan Valley, uh, so the Cagayan Valley is very well known for the megafauna finds of where you find rhinoceros, stegodon, elephants, etc. But uh, it's it's one of the few places where, where we find them. So yeah, it, it, it is quite variable in the um, yung, yung preservation uh, of uh, fossil vertebrates. Okay, something that you want to add, Larry? Um, uh, I guess only that there are a lot of caves in the Philippines, an awful lot, and most of them have not been excavated. And there are a lot of, of volcanic ash deposits, an awful lot. And some of those are places where fossils will have been preserved. I think that at this point, um, that, you know, it, it compared to East Africa, the Philippines may not ever be quite as productive. But I suspect that once people get out and really start looking hard, they're going to find a lot of fossils. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, the next question is related to what Lars is also saying. This is from Jay Fidelino from UP Diliman. He asks, what are the prospects of discovering more fossil vertebrates elsewhere in the Philippines? And where would you and other archeologists or maybe slash mammalogists be looking for them? Also curious about the possibility of finding bird and plant fossils here. Thank you for the great talk. Janine, why don't you go first on that? Um, actually, um, there's, we just have to survey. There's just not a lot of people doing the survey. so. Uh, we do have uh, paleontologists, so not just archaeologists, but paleontologists, particularly deal, those dealing with fossil records that are millions of years old. No? Uh, we just have to have more paleontologists uh, and archaeologists to, to survey and look for them. Uh, it's a matter of finding kind of the right ge uh, geological strata and the kind of um, archaeological traces uh, to, to find uh, these fossils. Um, I forget the other bits of the question. <laughs> so, oh, um, maybe Larry has some, something to add. Yeah, no, the, the other question, the, he is curious about the possibility of finding bird and plant fossils mm -hmm. also. Larry? Are, I, they don't preserve very well. They have more fragile uh, skeletons yeah. than, than that one. So one, one thing that I would add to that is that uh, um, in um, um, uh, cold climate regions, um, pollen is often found in the deposits at the bottom of lakes. In the tropics, that's less common because the, the lakes are warm 
um, and the, the, po the pollen tends to decompose. Um, however, there are quite a few lakes in the Philippines at high elevation, quite a few. And I've seen a number of them that look to me as though there's got to be lots and lots and lots of layers of sediment at the bottom of those lakes. And it gets cold at night in those places. <laughs> so I'd be willing to bet that there are pretty good pollen deposits up there. And some of them may go back quite a long way. They may go back you know, well into the last glacial maximum and, and maybe further. It would be wonderful to have that kind of information available for the Philippines. Yeah, so we need the uh, palynologists to actually core, survey and core those uh, lakes. <laughs> okay, um, we have one minute to do the Q&A, so I hope we could cover all this. Another question, what are your thoughts on the potential for finding sub-fossil neophiles in the Philippines from J.C. Gonzalez of UPLB? Sorry, sub-fossil what? Neophiles. Sub-fossil. Oh, neophiles. the cats. The cats. Yeah. Yeah, predatory mammals. Um, is um well for 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 sub fossils for Holocene um there's good potential no, for 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 these um uh, sort of medium sized uh, uh carnivores um. But for Neophilus itself, I, I I don't know that there, there are any records of that. Um. But we do have a lot of Holocene age sites. Um, yes, I, I, I don't know how, Larry, if you could add that. So, so um, uh, there are a lot more caves on Palawan, and that's certainly a likely, one of the more likely places to go looking for some of the other cats. Um, they're just, as, as Janine said, there just are not very many people doing this kind of work. Um, there are lots of opportunities. Okay. Um, I'll entertain one more question. So I'm sorry, guys, if I cannot uh, read all your questions. Uh, I'll just select one more. Um, are there possibilities that uh, these mammals are found in multiple fauna regions, especially in... Oops. Sorry. Uh, Again, uh, are there possibilities that these mammals are still present but left undetected in our in our forest? Mm. Well, probably not the elephants or the stegodon. <laughs> the big ones, if they were around, we, we definitely know. Um, uh, might there be some of these giant cloud rats that Janine and I just described? Um, that we think are extinct, might they be hiding somewhere in the Philippines? I suppose so. Um, certainly, um, there are many parts of the Philippines where there have been no mammal surveys done. Um, uh, uh, and, and there is definitely need for much more, much more field work. Um, um, my, my guess is that it is more likely to make, um, you know, brand new dramatic finds um, in Mindanao, greater Mindanao overall, than on Luzon, simply because there, there have been many more people who uh, have done research um, on Luzon, both with living species of mammals and with, well, particularly the archaeological record. So maybe get out there, do the field work, find out. I'm too old. You guys have got to do it. <laughs> yeah. Janine, you want to say one last word? I'll, no, not, no, nothing to add. Okay. So with that, thank you. Let's again, uh, maybe we clap our hands to La for Larry and Janine for a wonderful talk. If you are still have questions after, after this, you can post them in the lobby. And then we'll forward this to the speakers and hopefully in one of the sessions, they, they can answer you. Okay. Um, so thank you, Larry and Janine.